how do I tell you you're perfect the way you are? And I'm going to be much more nuanced than just that statement that we hear all the time. You're perfect the way you are. Your body is perfect the way it is. How you experience your body is the dysphoria. And I'm saying that from someone with gender dysphoria. Welcome to the Holistic Life Navigation Podcast, where we explore life through the lens of somatics. I'm Luis Mojica, a somatic educator who teaches people how to find safety in themselves. Your turn to learn begins now. So today I'm going to be talking about how we navigate gender dysphoria holistically without an urgency model. When I say an urgency model, it means you have someone, whether it's a child, whether it's an adult, who experiences gender dysphoria, and you're met with the urgency of we have to fix this right away. Because when we go into that, we lose a lot of the nuances of what the expression of gender dysphoria might be telling us, because there's actually a lot of different roots that gender dysphoria blossoms from. I first want to introduce you to my experience of gender dysphoria. I don't teach this just as a clinician or as someone who is an ally to queer people or someone who is against or for any kind of trans care. I'm sharing this from my personal embodied experience with being gender dysphoric. I was born intersex with an intersex expression. I did not have ambiguous genitalia, and that's why I call it an intersex expression rather than the full intersex expression, which is ambiguous genitalia. But I did have female and male sex characteristics, which include excessive amounts of estrogen that caused my body to develop breast tissue, which then became breasts, larger hips, a softer body. I was unable to build muscle for a long time, and I had a very feminine disposition. I felt like a girl. And I felt like a girl until I was probably 14, 15 years old. I remember growing up sitting on the toilet, looking at my penis and looking for the, the proof, the scarring that someone put that on there surgically. This is before anyone was talking about anything in the mainstream around gender or sex reassignment surgery or any of these things. It was this innate feeling that this wasn't supposed to be here. So I was actually quite dysphoric about my penis when I was young. Its actual existence felt opposite to the rest of my body. The softness, my little breast buds, my hips, and my overall feminine disposition and my personal inner identity of being female. In today's society, I might have been viewed as trans as a young kid because literally my body was ambiguous biologically, I identified as being female, and I didn't want my penis. I never told anybody this growing up. I was alone with that. And if it was something in the mainstream culture that my dysphoria or how I felt about my penis meant I was probably trans, I would have probably taken steps toward changing my body. Actually, I know I would have. If someone would have told me, well, you can change this and be a, a girl, I would have done it immediately. And because I have an intersex expression, I had another experience that was the opposite. As I started getting more testosterone, which my body mysteriously began producing later in puberty, like around 15, I started feeling a little more like a male. I started feeling a little more masculine. I started relating to my penis differently and realizing it wasn't just sewn on. It's a real thing and it works and it feels good and all these things. And so my breasts now became the source of my dysphoria. My hips became the source of my dysphoria. I wanted those things gone. And if someone said to me, I can give you a pill to keep your breasts from growing, I would have taken it immediately. And I know that because I also had cystic acne, severe cystic acne all over my face and my chest and my back. And on two occasions, I took a pill called Accutane that completely destroyed my liver and my immune system. And I've only recently got my liver functioning again. For the first time in 15 years or 16 years even of taking the medication, my doctor has said, you have healthy liver levels now, which is amazing. So I was able to rehabilitate my liver with herbs and nutrition and trauma work because your liver works really hard when you have trauma and ongoing stress. But my point is, if the urgency model was given to me as a child, I would have made a decision that I would now regret. So I'm making this video from a very centered, loving place. I want to be clear about that. I am not for or against 
anything except for urgency. And any of you listening to this can do whatever you want with that. You don't have to believe me. You don't have to agree with me. But when it comes to diagnosing children or adults as trans because they have gender dysphoria without any uh, nuance or questioning, I don't see that as helpful for their successful transitioning or their successful healing. And I'm going to tell you why. So stay with me for a moment. I first want to just go into um, teaching about gender dysphoria so we can understand what this term even means if you aren't familiar with it. Dysphoria really just means uh, disappointment, unease, frustration, angst, pain around something. So if someone's just generally dysphoric, they're at a place where life's really painful and, and difficult for them. Gender dysphoria means the way your body expresses is a source of your pain because it opposes how you feel. It opposes how you identify. I have had gender dysphoria since I was eight or nine because it was the first moment I noticed my breasts and my penis and there's something off. Something's off here is, you know, how it felt for me. And my gender dysphoria came from being intersex, not from being transgender. Gender dysphoria, however, isn't something that just goes away with surgery or medication. I ended up getting top surgery, which greatly helped. I can't say how much that helped. I would never put down top surgery. It helped a lot. And I was left with bigger hips because now my top was smaller. My hips were bigger. Trans men listening, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So I then had another 12 years of having to work on the dysphoria around my hips, meaning looking at this part of my body and not thinking it was disgusting, not thinking it would give me away, not thinking there was something wrong with me. And I'm still in the process of doing that, by the way. I call myself or I say for myself, I have a hint of dysphoria still because I'll look in the mirror. I'll be shocked because in my mind and in my senses and my spirit, I don't, my body doesn't look the way I feel it should or I feel I look. So I have a shock. In that moment of shock, there's a, a, a minute of disgust, not even a minute, that's maybe 10, 15 seconds. And then a love and an ease comes over me. So my relationship to my dysphoria has changed. The dysphoria hasn't gone away, but my relationship to it has changed. Whereas in the past, I would have gone down a rabbit hole of self-hatred and comparing myself to other bodies and thinking of all the horrible things people have said to me and are going to say to me again. And I would be completely immobilized by fear and pain. So dysphoria is not, um, it's not a joke. It's not just in someone's mind. It's not just this easy thing to get over. It's not someone just complaining. Gender dysphoria is really serious. It can <clears throat> affect your entire life. I remember when I had breasts, just the seatbelt going over my chest in the car would be enough to trigger my dysphoria. Because again, when we're talking about gender dysphoria, we're talking about sensations, visuals, the way people respond to you based on how your body expresses. That's opposite from how you feel, how you identify. I see gender dysphoria as an extremely spiritual experience. I understand and respect the need for it to be classified as a mental disorder <clears throat> just for insurance purposes so people can actually get the medical care they need. Yet, I see it as a spiritual experience because, and I'll go into more in a bit about the many causes of gender dysphoria, what it really is, like any issues we have with our bodies, it's our conscious mind, our spirit, our witnesser, right? Seeing the body and having an opinion about it, having a response to it, having a relationship with it. And with gender dysphoria, the relationship between the conscious mind and the body is a really painful one. It's not an unconditional one. It is not an easy one. It's not a loving one. My gender dysphoria felt like betrayal. My body felt like it was betraying me all throughout puberty, all throughout childhood, and as an adult. So I hated these parts of my body. That's how I, my conscious mind, responded to my body through hatred. And when I started to understand my dysphoria as a spiritual experience, it started helping me actually transform how I related to it. Rather than seeing it as a mental illness, or something I'm just stuck with, or something I can just cut off and get rid of. It became an actual tending to the rupture of how I treated and saw and dominated my body in response to the, the gender dys dysphoria. Now, 
What's interesting about gender dysphoria, and this is why the whole point of me making this particular episode is, well, I have two points in making the episode. One point is to give you the many different reasons why we can have gender dysphoria. So we stop overcoupling trans with gender dysphoria. The two go together, but they're not solely the only cause. Gender dysphoria is caused by a lot of other things, and I think it's important to pause, and this is the second point of this, of this video and this podcast, to pause when we are experiencing dysphoria or we're holding space for other people experiencing gender dysphoria, to let them have safe space and give them the capacity and help them, support them in navigating where it might blossom from before we call it trans. Why is that so important to me? I say this as someone who has worked with trans people. I say this as someone who has supported people in gender affirming care when they needed it. I say this as someone who has worked with people who thought they were trans and turned out not to be. Trans is a really big journey. It's not something to take lightly. It's not something that should be made a fad or a huge celebration. Being yourself is the celebration. Loving yourself as you are is the celebration. And I can celebrate a trans person being really open and this is me and I love myself and I am there for that. I will always be. What I <clears throat> can't help but notice is leaving out the path, the journey of being trans and how difficult and powerful it is. I have learned this from my trans elders, my dear friends in my life who I've seen, who have taught me and who I've held space for and they've held space for me around the, the journey of getting to love your body. And when you're trans, it is nearly impossible to love your body just the way it is without some kind of modification, whether it's sex hormones, whether it's surgery, whether it's facial surgery, bottom surgery, top surgery, some modification of the body must take place to even start inching towards self-love. And I know this very well from having had to get top surgery. I couldn't even consider someone touching my breast through my shirt knowing I had breasts. I couldn't even consider my partner, who is now my wife, knowing I had breasts. The thought of her knowing I had them made me want to die. I didn't have the capacity for her to see them, touch them, anything. And when I told her my secret, she accepted it. And for months, I still didn't take my shirt off. I still didn't have the capacity for her to be with that part of me. Then I got top surgery. And the top surgery became, for me, an extremely shamanic journey into recovery of the self, even into my ancestors. I discovered through my top surgery that a big part of my intersex expression came from unmetabolized ancestral trauma. Women in my family who had been suppressed, who had been abused, who had been hurt. And now my male body was expressing female characteristics. Something in my body was holding information from the past for me to be with. And when I had top surgery, I had cut out, literally, one of my feminine expressions. For me, there was an internal misogyny. I hated these breasts. I didn't know how to be close to them. They only represented for me violation and assault and being objectified by men, which I was my whole middle years of school until I started hiding and binding and masking taping my breasts down so people wouldn't notice them. So my connotation with breasts was a horrible connotation. And even without any of those things, I still might not have wanted to have those because it just felt opposite to how I identified, wanted to be seen, and felt in my spirit. And I'm saying my personal experience was so powerful, so shamanic, so uh, ancestral, so deeply somatic and spiritual, something that took me about 13 years to unfold and even understand, top surgery was my catalyst. Top surgery was my plant medicine. It wasn't the fix. It was the beginning. So I say that to anyone listening who experiences gender dysphoria, if you are scheduled for surgery, if you've already gotten it, if you think you want it, you're going to do what you're going to do and I respect that. I think everyone should move this body the way they need to in this lifetime toward whatever they need to and we'll learn through it. And just know that surgery is the beginning. It's not the end to healing dysphoria. Surgery removes the reminder. Surgery removes the trigger. Yet the practice of hating your body and feeling disconnected from your body 
is something that's in your bones. No one can remove that. It is a personal practice that you must be initiated into by yourself. And I don't mean by yourself alone. You can do it with a therapist, friends, groups, listening to things like this. But for me, the top surgery just started my ability to even have capacity to go there. So I needed that. I did. Not everyone does, but I did. I'm saying all this because the, I understand part of the trans experience, the need to modify the body surgically or hormonally to feel safe enough to even explore parts of yourself. And that's why I relate to the transgender experience so deeply. I am not trans, but I relate to it so deeply because I know that feeling of not feeling home in your body and no amount of meditation or therapy or nutrition or medication will help you feel at home in your body until your body is modified. And that's why I'm not quick to label people trans. That's why I'm not quick to say because you're non-conforming or because you're um, gender dysphoric, you're trans. For me, being trans, just like for me being intersex and needing top surgery, that should be the last choice. But what do we do? How do you hold space for someone that hates their body, can't stand being in it, and has years and years and years before they can experience a surgery that can help them feel safe? I'm going to go into that in a bit. But first, I want to talk about the many roots of gender dysphoria. I've experienced this with so many different people in my practice over the years, and I made a list based on these personal experiences that I've had with hundreds of some of these and dozens of others. Cancer of the sex organs is a major cause of gender dysphoria. This includes ovarian and prostate because it changes your experience of how you feel sexual, how you feel sensual, your ability to have sex, even your desire for sex. And when that changes and when your hormones change, especially when you have a hysterectomy because of cancer, you go into what's called a surgical or medical menopause. So your hormones change immediately. And when that hormone change occurs, you feel different. I know this from being intersex. I remember what it was like being flooded with estrogen and then suddenly having testosterone. I felt like a different person. It felt kind of insane in my mind and in my body and in my brain. So I'm saying this because I've witnessed and held space for people who have had cancer of the sexual organs, experienced gender dysphoria, especially when women have to get their breasts removed because of breast cancer. There's a sudden dysphoric feeling now of not having your breasts there. So gender dysphoria can come from that kind of illness and treatment of the illness. Puberty is one of the biggest causes of gender dysphoria. Most children who are going through puberty aren't ready for it, aren't prepared for it, haven't been taught what to do with it, and suddenly their body is doing things to them that feels shameful and violating and overwhelming, things they don't like. Children that are naturally very, you know, uh, sensual, not sexually speaking, but can sense and feel and experience emotions and, and felt sense. They're not sexual yet, unless they've been sexualized, which also I was as a child through being molested. But unless that happens to you, you're not a sexualized child. You're not fixated on these parts of you. Yet, when you start going through puberty, your sexual organs become a focus for you. You feel it in a period cramp. You see it in an erection. You see it in your breast swelling, in your hips expanding. These bodies start getting estrogenized, testosteroneized, <laughs> and through this uh, introduction of these sex hormones, we start um, transforming. And in this society, we don't have elders or rites of passages or a lot of initiations, if any, of how to relate to this new change in your body. In addition to that, we don't have good social structure of how other bodies experience these changes. The amount of women and people born into female bodies who have told me the most traumatic thing for them was when they started developing breasts and the men in their family, not just in their town, but in their family, started looking at them inappropriately. That will create gender dysphoria because now your breasts are the enemy and this part of your body feels dysphoric, feels uneasy, shameful, disgusting, and overwhelming to be with. Puberty is one of the greatest sources of dysphoria and it's why I believe in a non-urgency model when you're working with kids and teenagers who are believing or thinking they might be trans because they're dysphoric. Their puberty 
and how they're being sexualized and if they're experiencing sexual trauma or inappropriate sexual nature or even just early puberty, something too early for their body, that might be the source and it takes a couple years for that to actually ride out. So when I go to the end of this, I'll explain more about how do we hold space in this liminal uh, period before we make the decision to actually have a transition or not. I mentioned hormonal imbalances with cancer treatment. Hormonal imbalances are also attached to aging, to stress, to plastics in our food, to chemicals, to environments, so emotional changes, uh, events. So many things will change our hormonal experience inside. And when our sex hormones dip or get really high, we experience different experiences and that can lead to gender dysphoria. I've worked with men who are gender dysphoric, who don't feel like men, don't quite feel like women, don't know, quote, what they are. And they realize their testosterone levels are very low because of plastic. So their estrogen is higher, let's say. And then they do the work, they work with their liver, they get on a more balanced diet, they remove themselves from chemical fragrances, plastics, and they start feeling more aligned with their body expressions. So hormonal imbalances and aging, which also changes your hormones, really big part of gender dysphoria. I've felt this the most with men, some women, but in my practice, just personally, most of the men I've worked with have experienced gender dysphoria as they get older and they start losing their libido because they have overcoupled a sex drive with being a man. So they feel an extreme amount of shame and dysphoria around that part of their body and even having sex with someone because they can't get an erection and they don't have the libido they once had. Speaking of that, one of the other greatest sources of gender dysphoria is social or are social constructs. Social constructs and gender roles actually enforce gender dysphoria. If I'm a girl who wants to play with trucks and I've been told there's something wrong with that, I start feeling dysphoric about my expression, about quote, a more masculine expression. That could mean in the future, I'm actually a trans man, but it doesn't always. We just don't know until we sit with the developing body and mind of this child and get to know where it goes and how they end up settling into that. Because social constructs and gender roles impose a really limited box around how someone's supposed to, supposed to express or what someone's supposed to like just based on their biological sex. That in and of itself can create gender dysphoria. I said this earlier about my own experience. I believe gender dysphoria can be ancestral. I've had several close trans male friends who have told me that through their transition, through going on testosterone, getting top surgery, appearing as a man in the world and feeling living as a man now, that they have healed something in their personal lineage from the men in their families. The unspoken shame of the feminine, the um, dominance that masculinity has had over female bodies in their history, something in their body alchemizes it. And this is part of the spiritual experience of being trans, not just gender dysphoria, but specifically being trans. When you can understand the lineage and the somatic experience of being trans, you realize that your body is alchemizing, it's transmuting something from the world, from your lineage from your personal history and childhood experience. And this is where I say being trans or having the trans experience is a really beautiful thing when we see it through this context. It's a transformation. There's a magic to that for me. And when it's coming from a place, not of urgency, but of sitting with the body, befriending the body, getting to know the body you were born with, and from there transitioning, it becomes a much more, let's say, body friendly, and spirit friendly experience. And it goes much deeper and it's much more successful. When someone's experiencing gender dysphoria and it just continues and continues and continues, and the only relief they get is from, let's say, social transitioning, which is dressing like the opposite sex, appearing as the opposite sex, using pronouns of the opposite sex, and they start feeling a release and they start feeling a safety in their body and they stop bracing and they feel alive and confident and they want to live, you're experiencing somebody who might be transgender. 
Now, I am not a licensed clinician. I'm not a psychotherapist. I am not a, so a clinical social worker. Anyone that knows my history knows I dropped out of school when I was majoring in psych because I didn't want to identify and label people. And instead, I went to the, I went down the nutrition path. I went down the coaching path, and I became a somatic experiencing practitioner. So my therapy is in nutrition and somatics, right? But just from the many people I've worked with, the many therapists I've collaborated with over the years around these experiences, that's when we tend to see, okay, you are appearing to be transgender. And there's a list of other ways that someone is diagnosed that way. But what I'm saying is you want to give time for the gender dysphoria to be with the individual. You want to support them in that. So eventually you see if it lifts or if it doesn't. And if it starts to lift, that means they're actually coming into their body and uncoupling some of these negative connotations they've had with what their body looks like or what it's doing, as well as negative connotations they've had with social constructs or non-conforming gender roles or expressions they might have. That's someone that isn't probably trans. They're just getting to know their own unique body and their own uniqueness. However, someone who's trans is a very binary person. The root of trans is a binary experience. You don't believe you're in the right sex. You want to change your sex. You want to transition to the opposite. So when transitioning to the opposite is the only thing that gives some settling, and you learn this through first a social, non-medical transition, which, like I said, clothing, makeup, pronouns, name change, then you get to know from doing that for a bit, I actually am finding relief in this body, and I want to go to the next step. So you titrate it. So I'm already starting to bring in how do we hold this with non-urgency. We start, just like Buck said on this last episode, we start by not labeling someone as trans just because they're dysphoric. What you do is you relate to them with that expression, their gender dysphoric. Let's get to know about this. And as you sit with them, you start to learn about what do your breasts mean to you? What's your experience with your breasts? If it's a child, what does it feel like to want to play with dolls if you're a quote boy? What does it feel like to put on a dress if you're a quote boy? Do you like being a boy in a dress or do you think you can only be a girl in a dress? Do you like being a girl in a dress or do you think you can only be a boy in a dress? You ask these questions and you take your time with the individual to get to know their own personal mythology, first of all, around gender. What have they absorbed? What do they experience? And do things start uncoupling as they sit with their own expressions and get comfortable with them? When I say take time, I mean take time. So if you're dealing with a child that's dysphoric, me personally, if, I was, if it was my child or I was working with that person, I would tell them when you're older, you can consider surgery if that's what they say they want. For now, I'm going to help you be as authentic as you can be. I'm going to support you in that and I'm going to help other people support you in that. And I'm going to tell you one reason I believe this is important is it's beyond ideology or my personal even um, beliefs around this or my personal experiences. It's the, the, the sheer nature and fact of um, uh, a successful bottom surgery. This is important and a successful relationship life. When children are, let's say, 9, 10, 11, 12, and they want to go on puberty blockers because their puberty, like I said earlier, is a source of dysphoria, which doesn't mean they're trans. It could be, doesn't always, but they want puberty blockers to ease the stress of puberty. We want to hold children through the stress of puberty, not distract them or avoid the stress of puberty. And there's two important reasons why. Number one, we want to learn how to be with what's uncomfortable. I know this is triggering for some people because we hear that children who aren't given these things will take their lives. And sometimes that happens and it's case by case. So I'm not going to put out a blanket statement, but many times that doesn't happen. I was one of those kids that thought about suicide for years. I never did it. I'm not happy that I did. I'm not happy that other kids have to go through that. And I know it's also one of the portals of suffering. I know adults who lose their best friend in a car accident or their partner or have a miscarriage and they want to take their lives. And I know some adults that go through the same thing and they don't want to take their lives. We all have different responses to discomfort and pain and anguish and suffering. So if the urgency comes from the fear of someone taking their life, you want to pause into that 
and really notice if that's their first go-to to take their life, they need more support around that than the thing itself. That's the piece we want to hold, the actual suicidal ideation, not let's put you on a puberty blocker so you don't take your life. Now that's one piece. Another piece when it comes to puberty blockers is they can create instances where you have an unsuccessful bottom surgery because when your genitals are not being fully matured, which is what puberty does, you get estrogen or testosterone that matures your sex organs over many years. When that doesn't happen, you don't have the tissues, you don't have the growth, you don't even have the nerve sensation that these hormones bring to life during puberty to one, have a successful bottom surgery, and two, have a successful sex life, to feel the, the bliss of an orgasm, those things can literally be impacted through early puberty blocking. It's been documented. Marcy Bowers herself has said that this is something that has occurred in her practice and she's seen almost 100% across the board with specifically biological males who have been um, puberty blocked from ages 9 to 11. And that's really important to me that that removes the humanitarian political divide around this subject. And it goes to what I talk about with everything I talk about, the soma, the body. How can we support this body to develop healthfully? So in the future, if a child is trans, they can have a successful bottom surgery and they can have a successful sex life. They can procreate if they wish to. They can just simply feel and enjoy the bliss of orgasmic sensation. That's something I like to consider in this equation when we're talking about kids with dysphoria and how we hold that. And that's something when the child's getting old enough to say, I want puberty blocker, to teach them. Your puberty helps transform your body so you can feel pleasure, so you can have kids someday. So you can actually have the maturity of that area to transform it if you need to when you're older. How can I hold you in this puberty while honoring your identity, how you are testing your identity, what clothing you're trying on, what relationships you're trying on, whatever you're doing to help you navigate this strange sensation of having a body and feeling gender dysphoric? How can I support you without stopping your puberty? That's a question I want more people to ask themselves who are in this situation, clinicians who are in this situation, parents, allies, teachers, friends. Not that you're wrong, not that you shouldn't want that. Who wouldn't? I would have given anything to stop my breast growth when I was 12. Anything. But that wasn't even offered to me at the time, so I suffered with it. But that's not a good role either. That's not a good path either. I don't want children suffering in isolation and shame, and I don't want them jumping into medication and surgeries. Where's the middle? Where's the middle ground? That's what I'm hoping to uh, inspire here with this um, episode today. A big part of the middle ground for me that I've seen with my clients is how do I tell you you're perfect the way you are? And I'm going to be much more nuanced than just that statement that we hear all the time. You're perfect the way you are. Your body is perfect the way it is. How you experience your body is the dysphoria. And I'm saying that from someone with gender dysphoria. My body functions, if I didn't have my breasts removed, nothing would happen with that. My body functioned just fine. I would procreate still if I wanted to. I can have orgasms. I enjoy sex. I have health. I have energy, I digest my food well, these hips don't get in the way of any of that stuff. This stuff, meaning the shape of my body, tells a story that there's something wrong with me. And in that story, I experience gender dysphoria, but my body itself is completely fine. And I recently experienced this with someone, they're gonna actually come on the podcast in the future to talk about it. Someone that took my course and had this experience of noticing and this is someone who is non-binary, they would call themselves genderqueer. They realized my body is female, I'm not. And I was lit up because that is the spiritual experience of gender dysphoria. My body, Luis, is an intersex body. There are male and female characteristics. My spirit, not quite. My spirit really sees this body as male. Yet, and maybe this is because I'm intersex, it might be different. 
I've been playing the last 13 years with my spirit probably being more ambiguous than I think. All of our spirits being more ambiguous than we think. I don't think our spirits are male or female. I think they are so much beyond that. And the body does limit the spirit. I've talked about this in the past. Gender dysphoria is often, and also, I should say, a result of the body limiting the spirit. For instance, my spirit is multidimensional, so I can feel male some days, I can feel female some days, I can feel like a tree some days, that's a true story. And my body is limited, it can't take on all those forms. So I look at it, and it comes up short sometimes. So when we can teach our children, our friends, our clinicians, whoever it is, if we can teach people from a young age that your body's going to do weird things because you're inhabiting your body, but you're not your body, they can become a friend to their body. Meaning, if they experience gender dysphoria, they won't identify with it as much. They'll realize, just like this person did, that I can't wait to have on to talk about this. My body is one thing. My spirit is another. How do I bring them together? How do I have them speak to each other? Let me hold space for your spirit that's like, I don't want these breasts. And I'm like, I get it. You don't want them and someday you can get rid of them. And right now, can we be with your body? And can we realize this is what your body is doing naturally? And when your body is done unfolding, when it's going through its changes, when it's, for me, when children are grown and they're beyond their, their teens, I say like early 20s, mid 20s, that's a really good time to consider something that would be irreversible. Whether it's surgery, whether it's long-term hormones, whatever it is, that's a really good time to say this body isn't ready. Now, a lot of people listening to this are not going to like that. And again, I respect it. I'm not an authority on this. I'm speaking from my experience as a professional and as someone who still has gender dysphoria. That there is a way to hold the space and slowly unfold it with somebody. There is a way to identify safe people for this person to express themselves sexually, to express themselves creatively, to go into situations where they are safe, where people know their identity and they know their biology and they know what the person is dealing with and they're supporting and loving them and helping them learn this body as it is. I remember one client that was so moving to me, um, a 14 year old and a 16 year old, and the 16 year old telling me that they were planning on um, having a sexual experience with their friend who was trans because this trans person felt safe with them and they felt safe with the trans person and they wanted to experience what sex would be like with that body not being changed yet because they weren't ready for surgery. They weren't ready for hormones. They wanted to see what it was like to be, let's say you're born female, to have the male role sexually without changing anything biologically, without changing anything surgically. It's those creative small, titrated, safe steps that help kids and anyone enjoy the body they're in until the day comes where they're ready and able to change it, where they're ready and able to shift it and transform it. So I hope this episode gives something to any of you that are looking for something in the middle because this conversation has become so big and so divisive. There's people either screaming from one side that no one should transition or kids should never. There's someone on the other side saying they should, you're horrible if you don't let them, you're transphobic. Then there's people like me, and by the way, lots of people who are trans and not in the middle saying, can we just sit with this and talk about this and explore this? Can we take our time with this? Can we start creating care plans and spaces that allow for the ambiguity rather than an urgency medical model that's just about fixing it as fast as we can in order to prevent discomfort or some kind of future um, possible suicide or pain. That's a really big thing to sit with as a parent and as a child. I often think how nice it would have been when I was going to doctors and when I was going to surgeons and if one person would have said to me, you know, Luis, you're intersex, and this is the way your body was meant to be. Do you want to sit with that a little bit? No one did. Everyone agreed with me that my breasts were horrible. Everyone agreed with me that I should get rid of them. Everyone told me I'd be happier without this nuisance on me. No one said, maybe you could be beautiful with this. And when I, as I'm 
wrapping this up, I can feel my emotions of what's propelling me to speak about this. It's to honor that child in me that didn't get the opportunity to even sit with that ambiguous body and say, well, can it exist? Do I have to hide it? Do I have to cut it off? And I think of now how amazing this society has become with exploring gender and exploring gender nonconformity. And had I been born into that generation, maybe I would have taken pride in my intersex body instead of hating it and hiding it and shaming it and waiting for the day I could cut it off. Or I could have still been born in that period. I could have still felt prideful of my intersex expression, which I do now. I'm very, I love the body I was born into. I love how ambiguous I am because of it. I love how I can see so many different sides of the equations of life because of it. All my pain I went through because of it. So much has created the medicine from which I teach and work from. That maybe I was supposed to get top surgery. Maybe it's okay that I love having a masculine chest. Maybe in this lifetime, I am allowed to enjoy the body modification and transformation and gender affirming care that I was given and that other people are given. I don't see a one or the other. It all belongs. And I hope you can feel into your body. And regardless of what choice you're making or someone you love is making, do it through a relationship to the body not being at war with it, not dominating it, not hating it, but loving it for what it is and speaking to it through the whole step, through all the steps of transforming it or getting into a place where you love it or feel more comfortable with it. That's my prayer uh, for anybody here listening. That's the end of today's episode. Now let's take a moment to notice where we feel the episode in our bodies. Close your eyes. Take a breath and let whatever wants to come up, come up. And remember, those sensations hold the wisdom that we're looking for. If you want to go deeper, visit holisticlifenavigation.com.